Welcome to this tutorial. It's all about the role of sociology on social policy. What I'll do is I'll give you an overview of the main sociological views, examples of policies and laws and how they have impacted social lives. This is perfect revision for 10 and 20 mark questions for the theory and method section on paper one and paper three. To accompany this video, there is a summary sheet that you can use. This will include all the main views, application of examples and evaluation points. Absolutely perfect to put on your wall to help with your revision. So what is a social policy? Now, a social policy is a proposed plan or action made by a government that will have an impact on society. Now, usually these policies include those that impact welfare, housing, education and the criminal justice system. So what is sociologists role in this? Should a sociologist research influence box becomes a policy? And to help answer this question, we need to make the distinction between a social problem and a sociological problem. So a social problem is some piece of social behaviour that causes public friction and or private misery and it calls for a collection action to solve it. So this is where you can pause it and come up with as many social problems as you can. OK, so you might have identified things like poverty, educational underachievement, juvenile delinquency, antisocial behaviour, divorce, um, domestic violence. These are all seen as social problems. So what about a sociological problem? So this is any pattern of relationship that calls for an explanation. So in other words, any piece of behaviour that we want to make more sense of. Again, one minute to pause and then join back in. So you might have thought of things like, why do people get married? Why do people no longer go to church? Why to have children or not? These are all questions that sociologists might ask. And it could be of interest to study things like normal patterns of family life, normal patterns of behaviour, and just discover knowledge for its own sake. So based on this, a lot of sociological problems may be of no interest to the government. However, if they are a social problem, they are more likely to. So even when sociologists do conduct research into social problems, there is no guarantee that it, the policymakers uh, will study their findings or the solutions that they propose will find their way into social policies. And a lot of factors may affect this, and I've popped that in the green box there. And we'll refer back to some of these as we go through um, when we look at the criticisms of some of these policies that we've looking at. So let's turn our attention now to what sociologists think about what social policies are. So this is where you can use the slides to help complete the summary grids. So starting off with positivist and functionalist, early functionalists such as Durkheim, you can see him there, did conduct research during the Enlightenment period. And this is a term to explain a period of time where rational thinking, scientific discovery and technology was creating advancements in society. And they believed that sociological research based on social facts could influence society for the better. So we've got some examples of what we could do to um, get AO2. So, for example, he proposed a meritocratic education system and abolishing um, inherited wealth to make society further to promote social cohesion. We've also got other um, examples such as housing and family policies, and these all help families perform their functions more effectively. So we can see some strengths with this. This social policy benefits everybody. It helps maintain society run smoothly. You might use words like value consensus, social cohesion um, and benefit everybody. They also favour tackling one social problem at a time. And this is called the piecemeal approach. Now, this is criticised by Marxists because they argue that it ignores the wider societal issues that require the basis of society to change rather than looking at the individual issue that they're targeting. The second viewpoint is the social democratic perspective, and this approach wants a major reshuffle of society to redistribute wealth from the rich to the poor. So a little bit like Robin Hood. 
Townsend is one of the main thinkers. He argues that sociologists should be involved in researching social problems and making policies to fix them. And his piece of research, and this is your AO2 example, was into poverty. And this influenced a lot of welfare policies, one of which was called the Black Report. And they made 37 recommendations for policies, um, some of which you might recognize, such as free school meals, improved working conditions, better benefits for disabled and improved housing. Now, you can get a little bit of evaluation here because this was produced by the Labour, Labour government in 1977, but the, the report was only finished in 1980. By this point, Thatcher's government had come into power and this new government um, failed to implement some of the recommendations due to cost as being an issue. So you can add that as a little bit of AO3. So some further criticisms come from Marxist. Marxists would argue that these recommendations do not go far enough. It doesn't solve the problem of capitalism, for example, and the total restructure of society needs to change in order to solve some of these problems. Marxist also agrees with my previous criticism as well. They would argue the capitalist state is unlikely to introduce public spending that benefits the working class at the expense of the ruling class. And postmodernists would always claim that this is just another version of the truth and um, it's a meta-narrative and sociologists should only take the role of interpreters. They should not be um, being becoming the lawmakers themselves. Marxist, they argue that the role of sociology is to be critical of capitalism. They believe that all policies benefit the ruling class in some way. And these policies are created in the interest of the ruling class and they act as an ideological function. And we've got some examples here about how it might do this for AO2. So, for example, the NHS. The NHS is maintaining a healthy workforce so then they can go back out to work, um, producing money and profit for the capitalist system. It becomes the curving face of capitalism and they believe that that is ideological. Another example might be things like pensions. These are maintaining older workers who are no longer productive for the capitalist system. Let's keep them at the cheapest possible cost. So for AO3, let's just evaluate the Marxist viewpoint. So this idea that sociologists should be exposing oppression is impractical and unrealistic, according to Marxist. Um, just uncovering the nature of capitalism doesn't go far enough. Social Democrats criticise this idea that Marxists believe that research can't bring progress, that the um, that, that the ideology stops people realising that they're being exploited. They argue that in reality, some poverty researchers have at times had some positive impact on policy. And we know that there has been some progress made in terms of welfare benefits that have targeted um, the working class, for example. So moving on to feminist, feminists would argue that the role of policies often reproduce this idea of patriarchy and they look at a range of policies that might reinforce patriarchy. But there are also policies that enforce equality of opportunity as well. And this is where you can do a bit of analysis by comparing radical feminist viewpoints with liberal feminist viewpoints. So, for example, our radical feminist would look at family policies as assuming the, the normal, and I'm using that in inverted um, commas, is the heterosexual nuclear family. And policies such as tax breaks for married couples, maternity benefits, benefit all are reproducing the ideology of this nuclear family which maintains an inequality between men and women. Now liberal feminists would disagree. They would argue that some policies have created a march of progress. We've got quite a few equal opportunities policies. Um, especially in education for example the national curriculum just and wise um, and they have really promoted opportunities for girls to have the same opportunities for boys in areas that were dominated by boys in the past. Equal opportunities um, through the Equal Pay Act, again, has also liberated women. So we can make those comparisons there between the different types of feminists to get analysis marks. 
So in order to evaluate, there's lots of positive from feminist research. Um, like I mentioned already, it has impacted policies in education. We've got more learning materials that promote positive images of females. Teacher training has changed to avoid gender bias and promotion of inclusiveness um, of both sexes um, in areas that are traditionally not that gender domain. Radical feminists would argue that the progress made by liberal feminists is not enough and Marxist also will say that it's not far enough either. Our final viewpoint is from the new right. Now, this is a conservative viewpoint or often influenced conservative, um, the political viewpoint. And they believe in reducing government interventions um, in order to make people a lot more self-sufficient, self-reliant and less reliant on government. And policies that they look at tend to be from um, welfare benefits. So you might Remember Charles Murray, um, who argued that welfare benefits create perverse incentive, rewarding irresponsible behaviour, this produce of an underclass, those that are not even working, reliant on benefits and creating this culture of dependency. We've also got policies from Wilson and Kelling, the broken window thesis, which has really influenced in zero, zero tolerance policing and also, again, community intervention, um, environmental um, crime prevention strategies. Let's nip crime in the bud and the role of the community in coming together, tackling incivilities, for example. And finally, Breakdown Britain. This was a conservative report by the Social Justice Policy Group. And what they did was produce a list of new policies to promote par marriage, parenting classes and mother staying at home. Like I said, it's a conservative viewpoint, traditional viewpoint, which we know we could criticise by using feminist, for example. Further evaluation, so we can question the validity of the research from Charles Murray. Um, he made this link between absent fathers and delinquency, and we know that that can be questioned. Um, a lot of emphasis on lone parents, and we know that that there isn't that clear correlation between um, lone parents and delinquents. Um, and antisocial behaviour. And new right policies hardly use real sociological research. Instead, they use politically sympathetic think tanks. So already there's a little bit of bias in there as well, that they are using research to find answers which will support the policies that they want to create. So to finish off, what extent are sociologists involved in social policy research? So despite the extensive work of sociological research, the creation of social policies is often very complicated. There are a range of factors that will influence how social policies are made. And sometimes they are only created in the interest of the powerful groups, um, the, the political priorities of the time. So if we want to go back to the Black Report, this was criticised by Margaret Thatcher because it contradicted what they wanted. So at the time it didn't get public approval. Whereas if you fast forward another 20 years, the Labour government in the 1990s, they actually liked similar research and they did make it influence um, health policies at that case. Sometimes sociological research often uncovers inequality and it's often quite an uncomfortable truth and sometimes it becomes ignored by governments because um, they don't like what they see basically. And finally, is it based, the sociological research, on empirical evidence? If it's not based on um, like factual, scientific um, evidence that way, sometimes governments might not see it as far reaching enough, representative, reliable research. So again, it might not influence social policy in that way. So massive thank you for watching. This video has summarised the relationship between sociology and social policy. You should have produced a summary grid highlighting the main viewpoints, the AO1, examples of different policies from quite a few topics that you will have studied over the last two years and some evaluation points also to help you along the way. And if you will add um, a little bit of a definition at the beginning and the, the conclusion at the end, you have made yourself um, a, a student answer for a 20 marker which you could be asked about if you've got any questions pop them in the comments below and if you've liked this video click that like button